Тази проява е в рамките на, 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 на серия от прояви, свързани с а, а, нашия, регион, нашия семинар за изучаване на президентската институция, съвместно с Евразийския център, това е един нов проект към а, исторически факултети, то проект от направени докторанти и постдокторанти. Основно от катедрата по нова и съвременна история, направлението, което се занимава с история на Русия. Така че, а пък президентския семинар беше открит с лекцията на господин Плевнелиев на 2 март в университета и той самият президент даде така една, едно рамо в смисъл, че се съгласи да бъде патрон на нашия семинар и също времено да така, осигури включването на семинара в президентския протокол с възможност за срещи и изяви на гостуващи в България по покана на президентската институция. Така че това разбира се е представител за част на семинара. Един академичен семинар, който аз имам удоволствието за ръководя и председателствам, е преди всичко академична институция и основното в нашата идея с този семинар е да провокираме изследвания, интерес, знания в областта на президентската институция по света и у нас. И разбира се, това е провокирано и от тази много рядка а, ситуация тази година, когато имаме президентски избори в три от големите а, президентски републики в света. Едната вече, единия вече мина избор, това беше избора на Владимир Путин в Русия. Втория подобен избор предстои, това е във Франция, а третия ще бъде през есента в през мене на Съединените щати. А, така че. Дали ще бъде 3 от 3, 2 от 3 или само едно от 3, което вече се получи повторение на президентския избор на една голяма нация, предстои да видим, но днес е, е, е мое удоволствие да, да ви представя за тези, които не го познават, професор Марк Креймър, директор на Института за изучаване на Цетър, за изучаване на студената война в Хайванския университет. Един от най-големите специалисти в областта на Русия, източна Европа, особено на студената война и периода след нея. Така че използваме случая на неговото присъствие в България, за да учим отново на хора тук в тази зала, които откъдено са учували, но за тези, които не, не са го чували, това ще бъде наистина една възможност да се да се видят, да го видят на живо, както се казва, и да имат възможност да чуят неговите размисли по въпроса за резултатите от руските избори, контекста на, на тези избори, какво се случи в Русия и как се случи. Естествено, това ще бъде американската гледна точка, гледна точка на един изследовател, който винаги е имал мнение по въпросите, които по които пише, така че, така че му давам думата. Благодаря много, Костадин. Професор Грозиев е много колега и приятел от мен от България. Йодан Баев, който е, мисля, още един. И така, аз съм много пъти до България. Understand Bulgarian, but don't speak it particularly well, which is why I apologize for speaking in English. When I am here um, at the end of next week or the week after, I will uh, be giving a, a separate lecture on the U.S. presidential election and its implications for U.S. foreign policy. And for that, I hope to do it in uh, Bulgarian, which will require considerable preparation. But the um, uh, but today I'll speak in English. If anything is unclear, please ask me. The layout of this room makes it hard to ensure that I'm speaking loudly enough. So if, if for some reason you have trouble hearing, just let me know. But the um, if you think back a year, uh, 
quite a bit has changed in Russia, but also a lot has not. And what I'm going to be talking about today will be uh, what has changed, what hasn't changed, and what the implications are for Russian foreign policy, especially relations with the West. And the thing that struck me last year, I was in Russia numerous times last year, I think a total of eight separate trips there, some for as long as two to three weeks. And starting in February or so of last year, a little over a year ago, uh, there was this real sense in Russian society of, of staleness, that the existing political system seemed to have brought stability to Russia and, a, and um, a degree of prosperity, but had not really moved the country to where a lot of people thought they could advance, especially younger people. And in the thing that really brought this home to me last year was there was an open letter pub, uh, that was posted online. And it was essentially a call for a new political system, the end of Putinism, the system that has revolved around Vladimir Putin for the last 12 years. And one of the signatories of this letter was someone whose name I was startled to see. It's someone I've known for a long time, Sergei Mironenko, who's the head of the State Archive of the Russian Federation. He's been head of that archive for the last 20 years. And in other words, he's a state employee. He's a senior government official as, as the head of that archive. Yet he signed this letter. He's, he's what I would regard as quite a liberal thinking character, um, especially in the Russian political context. But he'd always been cautious. He never really pushed things too far. I thought in looking at his signature on that letter, um, it really seemed to me to underscore how widespread this sentiment was that things had gotten stale. And they, they're, this was accompanied by a hope that uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who had come in as president in 2008, uh, replacing Putin, chosen by Putin to replace him, but a uh, hope that Medvedev might stay, and also a hope that Medvedev would somehow lead things in a different direction, particularly because the presidential term in Russia has now been extended to six years from the previous four. Uh, the I was somewhat skeptical of that from the beginning, but the uh, but that was certainly a widespread hope in intellectual circles in Russia. You began to see more broadly in public opinion that there was a decline of support, quite steady decline of support for the political party, if you want to describe it as a party, called Yedinaya Rasiya, the, the United Russia Party which is not really a political party. It doesn't really have an identifiable um, core of principles. Its real principle is to support Vladimir Putin. But the, um, Putin has never formally, though, been a member of that party. And in fact, uh, later in the year, it was announced that Dmitry Medvedev would take uh, responsibility for preparing the party for parliamentary elections last December. Now that, that decline continued throughout the spring and into the summer, and certainly by the late summer, early fall, there were senior uh, officials within that party who were predicting that they might not get a majority in the parliamentary elections. So that was evident uh, even by late summer of last year. But there were two crucial events that happened subsequent to that that really changed a lot of the dynamic, at least temporarily, in Russia. And much of this had very little um, consequence for Russian foreign policy, because Russian foreign policy under Medvedev, as I'll get to shortly, had, had changed a bit in certain ways, but not that much. It had remained basically 
the same policy it had been for the previous eight years. But the two things that changed things internally were first on the 24th of September, uh, both Putin and Medvedev, though it was clearly Putin's decision, they announced jointly at a gathering of the Yedina Garcia party that Putin would be the candidate for president in this, this year, this past, uh, earlier this month. So it essentially was announcing that Putin was coming back as president, having already served eight years in that role, and now having the ability to serve six more years, or possibly even 12 more years. It, uh, Putin later this year will turn 60. So in, uh, it's quite conceivable he could serve another 12 years. He would be um, 71 at the time of his, at the end of his second uh, consecutive term. So it would mean that for young people in Russia, who, who again, Putin came to the presidency at the very end of 1999 and had served uh, was, was elected in March 2000 and then was re-elected in March 2004. So he'd already served a little over eight years. He was coming back for at least another six years and uh, he announced that he was coming back for at least another six years and possibly 12. But beyond that though, it was the way the announcement was made that I think antagonized quite a few people in Russia. It, uh, Putin and Medvedev said that they had reached this decision, that is that Putin would return several years ago, uh, which I'm not even sure it's true. I've been told by several people who are in a position to know that in fact that's not true. But they, but they announced that they had decided all of this long in advance at the time that even before Medvedev became president that Putin would come back after a first term. Now there were people working for Medvedev who had openly called for him to run again, including obviously Mironenko, but, but there were a, a lot of others who were working directly under, uh, uh, under Medvedev. And suddenly they were told that that had all been a lie, had all been a sham, that in fact this had already been arranged, and that they were being left uh, to, to have exposed themselves as not fully supporting Putin. Um, that, so it was the, the manner in which the announcement was made that I think caused a great deal of uh, unease and, and really the sense among many Russians that they were being taken as fools and that their opinion wasn't being uh, given any importance. Beyond that though, then on the 20th of November, there was a mixed martial arts contest in Moscow, a championship contest. And a Russian uh, fighter was competing against, um, a very good Russian mixed martial arts fighter was competing against an American. And the, the Russian fighter defeated him. Putin made the, what clearly in retrospect was a mistake, but he uh, went down to congratulate the Russian fighter and began speaking into the microphone. and. There, for whatever reason it was, um, it may not have been politically motivated. From what I understand of people who were there, they said it wasn't because of political motivations. That in fact, it was just that they didn't like having their fights interrupted by any long-winded politician. It wasn't specifically anti-Putin. For whatever reason though, suddenly the crowd began to boo and to jeer at, at uh, Putin and, and began whistling in disapproval. And all of this was caught on video. And that video, even though the video was not shown on Russian state TV, it was shown on some other Russian stations. And more importantly, was readily available on the internet. And within 
three to four days had been viewed about 85 million times on the internet. And the, um, the large majority of those, not all of those views were in Russia. Some of them were in, in countries like, like uh, the Baltic countries and Poland and so forth, where they took great delight in seeing this. But, the, um, but a lot of them were in Russia. And that uh, dented what had been an, a kind of aura around Putin, that is this, this um, invulnerable image that he had, that you couldn't criticize him. And suddenly, he had become the object of ridicule, in, in, or seeming ridicule, in Russia. And by the time of the, the parliamentary elections in early December, the 4th of December, the, uh, during that time, from the 20th of November, that two-week period, until the time of the parliamentary elections, the support for Yadina Rasia, the, the pro-Putin party, had fallen even further. And in the elections, the Yadina Rasia did manage to gain a majority of, of the vote, but it is quite clear, based on statistical analysis, that that was achieved through fraud. And let me very quickly explain this. If you look at dist uh, voting analysis is a very well-developed field. It's one of the few things that political science can actually claim to have done reasonably well. But if you look at distributions of votes, what's called a Gaussian distribution, you can, what you'll usually see is roughly a bell-shaped curve. It might lean in different ways, but basically what it measures is the distribution of votes for a particular candidate um, in regions of the country. So you might see, say, 0% in a tiny number of regions. It'll climb up to, say, 30%, 40%. Around 45 percent, maybe begin to level off. And as you get to 100 percent, you don't want to see any voting for there, because if you see 100 percent voting, it's a pretty telltale sign that fraud has occurred. Well, it, it's well known that in the North Caucasus that there was fraud. Uh, in Chechnya, for example, 99.44 percent of voters voted for Yadina Garcia. And that, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to take that with a straight face. You, you realize that that was, was entirely fraudulent. But it wasn't so much the North Caucasus, because in Dagestan and in Ingushetia, there were similar votes. Those are small percentages of the population. But if you plotted this Gaussian distribution for the rest of the country as well, suddenly you have what are called large tails, which you don't want to see, because large tails are a tip-off that fraud has occurred. And you saw these regions in which suddenly it went up for Yadina Garcia to 98% or even 100%. Um, and so if you did an analysis of this, it showed quite clearly that fraud had occurred and that it was in favor of Yadina and Garcia. Now, how much that affected the result is unclear, but it, it's, it's uh, certainly evident that Yadina and Garcia would not have achieved a slight majority as it did. It gained about 51-52% uh, majority. It gained a larger percentage of seats because not all parties that gain votes end up in Parliament is a certain threshold you have to cross. But the, uh, but still, there were, when, when the protests began soon thereafter, and a lot of the protesters focused on fraud, their complaint was actually well-founded. There was fraud. Um, again, I still don't think it would have changed the basic result. But it, uh, but it clearly would have been a, a real perceived setback for Yadina Garcia if it had ended up with only, say, 43% of the vote, or 40% or so, because that was a huge drop from what it had been four years earlier. So the elections occurred on the 4th of December. On the 10th of December, Saturday, 
there was the first mass protest held in Moscow. That event was, um, again, at the end of this year in which there had been this erosion of support for Yadina Garcia, the pro-Putin party, and increasingly, especially after the incident on the 20th of November at the Mixed Martial Arts, there had been this also quite striking erosion of support for Putin. The Levada Center's polling, the Levada Center is an independent polling organization in Russia that does very good opinion polling. Um, and they, uh, they showed this drop of support for Putin in, by the 10th of December. It was, still wasn't known though, when that, uh, when that protest was held on the 10th of December, I happened to be in Russia at the time, no one knew how many people would actually show up. There had been many efforts by Russian opposition figures over the previous three to five years to try to generate protests against the government, but they'd never really gone anywhere. They were maybe 50, 100, 200 people, um, never more than that. And a lot of the organizers of the protest on the 10th of December had no idea how many people would come out. It turned out that they got, not only got more people than they expected, but it was too many people actually for the site where they were holding it and became dangerously crowded after a while. And the, uh, so there were, again, estimates vary, but my assessment of it from looking at the, the overhead photos that were taken and you try to calculate the number of people as it was probably about 75 to 100,000 people. By the standards, again, of mass protests in Russia, going from, say, 50 to 100 up to 100,000 is a big difference. And the authorities, the Russian authorities, were caught off guard initially because they had no idea how to respond to this, especially the calls for, uh, for a rerun of the elections, a demand that the government acknowledge fraud and that the elections be rerun. Well, that initial protest on the 10th of December was then followed on the 24th of December with another large protest. And that one, too, drew about 100,000 people, roughly. And there, too, there were the slogans used there, as they had been on the 10th of December, were openly critical of Putin. In many cases, scornful of Putin. From, uh, at that point, though, the 24th of December, with the approach of the New Year and then the Russian Christmas, uh, quite a long holiday break. The protest organizers, I think, made a strategic mistake on their part that they chose not to hold another mass protest until the 4th of February. During that long period from the 24th of December to the 4th of February, the authorities were able to, uh, having initially been caught off guard, they then tried to cope with the protests by a combination of some modest, very modest conciliatory moves, but also efforts to discredit the protesters. And that's where I'm going to go as I begin talking about relations with the West, especially with the United States. The, uh, the Russian government, and again, especially Putin, far more than Medvedev, um, but Putin de uh, depicted the protesters as agents acting on behalf of the U.S. government and alleged repeatedly that the protesters were being paid by the U.S. Embassy to come out or by other U.S. agencies to come out. And so you began to see at some of these protests the signs <laughs> saying, uh, U.S. State Department, where's my money? sort of thing, um, but again, trying to mock these efforts of the authorities to depict it all as a U.S. sponsored and paid for um, phenomenon. 
the, uh, at the same time, though, I, again, just ju judging by the Levada Center's polling, is that some of those efforts by the Russian authorities were quite effective in changing perceptions, uh, especially outside Moscow, not so much within Moscow, but as you got outside Moscow, the perception changed that, in fact, Western agents were involved in the protests, maybe even stirring them up. The, uh, the uh, shift in, um, in sentiment toward Putin here is also quite striking. And here again, I think it's a combination of both mistakes by the protesters, but also quite uh, effective responses by the authorities in discrediting, trying to discredit the protest. That if uh, the Levada Center's polls show that in late January, the uh, pro-Putin sentiment, that is the favorability rating for Putin, was down to its all-time low. It was down to about 37% which considering that as recently as a year ago it had been up around 80% is quite a stunning drop. By uh, late February, as the presidential election was nearing, that popularity had gone a lot of the way back up again to about 66%. And the, uh, that change of sentiment was a combination of mistakes by the protesters and having allowed the support they had to fritter away, but also by the effort by Putin to portray himself as the only source of stability in Russia and the one person who could keep Russia from dissolving into violent chaos. The, uh, so the, the combination of protesters' mistakes and responses by the Russian authorities meant that by the time the presidential election was held a few weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago yesterday, it, that uh, Putin received 64% of the vote, which was basically in line with the, uh, the, the pre-election forecast by the Levada Center. The Levada Center had said 62 to 65%. So the 64% roughly was right within that margin. And that suggests that fraud, even though there was, un there was clearly still fraud in the North Caucasus, again, the, uh, uh, Putin received, again, 99.5% of the voting in Chechnya. But beyond that, though, there seems to have been little if any, fraud. Um, certainly by the standards of Russian elections, it was probably cleaner than previous elections. And that means that between uh, December, mid-December, say, when Putin, was, Putin seemed to be somewhat at risk of having to go at least to a second round of the presidential election, because in Russia, uh, there are several candidates, or there were four main candidates for the election, if none of them gain a majority in the first round, the peer vetor, uh, then you have to go to a second round. And it was thought, even as late as, uh, as uh, the last week of January, that Putin might have to do that. By the time the election was held, there was no one either in the Putin entourage or in the uh, polling firms that expected that that would be the case. They predicted quite a sizable victory. So Putin was quite successful in fighting back against the protests, not, not by violently crushing them, as I think he was tempted to do, but uh, by depicted, trying to discredit them as agents of the West, and especially of the United States. Now that, uh, that is, then leading me to discuss some of the foreign policy implications of this. If you look at what the whole tone of the presidential campaign, this was really the first time Putin had been forced to run a presidential campaign because in the past his election had been so safely insured, uh, both because of genuine popularity within Russia and also because of control of the electoral process, that uh, that he 
had no need to run a presidential campaign. This time he actually did. I should add that one, uh, one qualifier, I should say, on the result he achieved is there was not a category for, in Russia, the same category has been permitted in some other former communist countries, but I wish it were permitted in the United States, is um, what they call protiv uh, to, to vote against, ev against everyone. And, and um, that's the way I would always vote in an election if it were available. But the, um, the, uh, that category had existed in the past in Russia, but in this election, the law was changed so that it was removed. If the Levada Center's polling showed that if people had been allowed to choose the Protiv uh the Protiv Sef, that, that um, Putin might not have won on the first round. He might have had to go to a second round. But because it wasn't allowed, he won very handily. Now, in depicting the uh, the protests against him as agents of Western imperialism, um, Putin was uh, really focused a lot of, not so much of his personal efforts, but the efforts around him, and especially the role of the pro-Putin media, including state TV, on the new US ambassador, Michael McFaul. I've known Mike, Mike McFaul and I were undergraduates together, and we were together at Oxford as Rhodes Scholars. And uh, I've known him you know, for about 25 years or so. And the sinister depictions of him in the Russian press and on Russian TV are just thorough distortions of reality. At the same time, there's no question that Mike has fairly strong views about the need for democracy in Russia. And he has written, published things about that in a way that gave fuel to some of these Russian um, attempts to caricature him, to portray him as out to inspire an orange revolution in Russia. Now, McFaul's appointment as ambassador had nothing to do with the forthcoming election. He actually had been nominated to become ambassador. He had served as uh, Obama's chief advisor on Russia within the National Security Council for since the start of Obama's presidency. And he had uh, been nominated to become ambassador in Russia at the end of 2010. But be, uh, just it had nothing to do with the ambassadorship itself, but because of congressional delays, he wasn't actually confirmed as U.S. ambassador until this past December, until a few months ago. The timing of it, though, was quite unfortunate because it gave the appearance, even though, again, it has nothing to do with reality, is that it gave the appearance that Mike McFaul was being brought in to try to destabilize the Russian political system and to uh, essentially bring about through math inspiring mass protest to bring about the downfall of Putin's regime. And that was the impression given on state TV as recently as two weeks ago, on the 14th of March. There was this extended program shown on NTV, as it's known. It used to be called the Nezavisimana Televidenia, the uh, independent television in Russia because it was independent during the 1990s. In 2000, Putin reasserted state control over it. He drove out the head of it, uh, Boris Berezovsky, and then, and then uh, reasserted state control over it. So the um, uh, Intived now is a very firmly pro-government, pro-Putin station. And on the 14th of, uh, however, it's shown uh, it reaches the entire country and therefore has a very sizable audience. On the 14th of March, it showed a two-hour program depicting the mass protests as having been inspired by the U.S. government and especially by Mike McFaul. And 
and as I wrote to Mike by email, and I said, I never knew you had such power. And the, um, uh, but, but basically it is continuing this depiction. You know, Putin by this point, it was well after the election, it was 10 days after the election, yet the media were continuing to portray the protests as a Western-inspired phenomenon to destabilize Russia. So I find that somewhat troubling that those sorts of depictions would persist even after the election. It was thought, certainly including by Mike, that, um, that the, uh, the, the effort to portray the West as the inspirer of the protests would begin to disappear after the elections. But in fact, that portrayal has, has persisted. Putin did, uh, I'm sorry, Obama did call uh, Putin to congratulate him after a period of about a week or so. Yeah, five or six days, he called Putin to congratulate him on his victory in the presidential election. And as I say, that it, it, it was a victory, that is, he won. He may have won because the Protiv Sef category wasn't there, but still, he did win. And the, uh, uh, so he called him and expressed hope that the heated rhetoric of the previous few months would dissipate and that they would be able to establish uh, cooperation on numerous issues. So let me look quickly at each of the, um, a few key issues and say how Putin's return. I don't think that Putin's return will drastically affect any of them because Medvedev had stuck to the same basic line. I'll try to do this in no more than uh, four to five minutes so that there's plenty of time for questions. But the uh, first category would be missile defense. Um, the uh, Obama and Putin will be meeting soon, uh, in a few days actually, um, where they, they, this is in connection. It's not a summit meeting. They're going to be taking part in a six power uh, or six party, not power, but six party conference on North, dealing with North Korea. And so at that gathering, uh, Obama and, and, uh, and Putin will get together. Even though Putin is not yet president, he doesn't formally return until May. But the, uh, at that gathering, they will be discussing missile defense, which is one of the um, difficult issues in U.S.-Russian relations. My sense is that they will seek some sort of compromise on this where the United States will offer written assurances that the missile defense is not aimed at Russia's missiles and they, there will be some sort of data exchange. It will probably be mostly cosmetic because it, I think any expert who looks at this can tell you that the missile defense system that's being contemplated would have no use against Russia. That is, Russia's arsenal could easily overwhelm it. Uh, and the orientation of the missiles even is not um, optimally configured to deal with Russia's missiles. It, it really is geared to deal with countries like Iran. So my sense is that they will reach some sort of uh, at least temporary compromise on that issue, but it will remain a sore point until the missile defense either fails to be deployed, which is a possibility, or is deployed and then the whole controversy dies over. Another issue which they likely will be discussing, but in any event is certainly going to persist, is the question of Syria and more generally how to deal with unrest in the Middle East. Syria has, uh, was a very close Soviet ally. It has remained a very close Russian ally. Russia sells large quantities of arms to Syria. It has uh, use of a naval, important naval base at Tartus, and uh, has, in general, close political relations with the Syrian regime. Uh, the Russians have blocked efforts within the UN Security Council, even within the UN General Assembly, tried to within the UN General Assembly, to condemn Syria, the Syrian government, 
for the killing of uh, what now is probably more than 8,000 people who have engaged in protest. The issue has been complicated some by the emergence of armed groups within Syria that are opposing the government. Initially, it was entirely peaceful protests, but the emergence of armed groups has complicated it. And the US government uh, last year went along with French and British pressure to intervene in Libya against Gaddafi's regime. My sense is that they will be far more hesitant about getting involved in Syria and any type of operation of that sort. And um, in part because of the opposition of Russia, Russia did go along initially with the intervention in Libya, although it quickly evolved into something that the Russians hadn't anticipated. But the, um, in this case, where Russia and China have been staunchly opposed, that will be part of the reason for the reluctance to intervene. But it's not a sufficient reason, because the United States intervened in Kosovo in 1999, despite Russia's opposition. It's more, uh, instead, it, the real reason for the reluctance to intervene will be the uh, questionable nature of some of the armed groups in Syria, and also the likelihood that a major military operation would be needed to get rid of Assad's regime. So my sense is that Syria will remain a source of real friction between Russia and most NATO countries, but won't become a source of conflict. Then finally, let me mention the question of Iran. The uh, whole um, the issue of whether to permit Iran to acquire nuclear weapons has been one on which, in principle at least, Russia and the United States and other NATO countries have a common interest. They would prefer that Iran not acquire nuclear weapons. The NATO countries are far more insistent about that, though. And in fact, there are many Russian officials who seem, they would feel that it's probably better if Iran doesn't acquire them but we don't really care if it does. It's not our problem. And that is not a view shared by any NATO country, and particularly the United States. Let me illustrate in part why that is. It's been talked about that Iran could be contained in the same way that, say, China was under Mao, that when China acquired uh, nuclear weapons in 1964, Many people feared that Mao Zedong, who was then belligerently anti-Western, and especially stridently anti-American, that he would possibly think about using the weapons. So the question then was, can China be contained? Obviously, China didn't use nuclear weapons. In fact, has never even contemplated it, um, as far as we can tell. So the, the uh, Containment in that case was, could be deemed a success. With Iran, containment is part of the issue, but it's not the only issue. Suppose, for example, that you were the US president and you received word from your intelligence community that Iran had supplied a nuclear weapon to Hezbollah or Islamic Jihad or Hamas. Um, what would you do? That, that intelligence report might be wrong. It might, in fact, be a report deliberately planted by the Iranians to try to force the United States into some sort of uh, rash, foolish action. But if you were the president, you would have to take that very seriously. And you get to the point in thinking about what Iran, uh, Iran's acquisition of nuclear weapons would mean, in which you might be forced to make decisions with inadequate information and with very little time to decide what to do. Because you don't want, if it is a real report and such groups have acquired nuclear weapons, you don't want them to be able to use them. Because once they do, it's gonna be awfully hard to prevent some uh, much wider conflict from erupting. So those are the sorts of reasons that the United States in particular, but other NATO governments, 
have been very worried about what to do with regard to Iran, to the point of contemplating as a last resort military action to destroy Iran's nuclear facilities. There are major uh, challenges to doing that because it's not thoroughly known where all of Iran's facilities are. And some of them are buried uh, very deep underground. The US military has prepared for such a contingency if it's needed, but clearly would not um, like to carry it out because it would be very difficult. Russia, it, to the extent though that the Russian government and especially Putin have a sense that the US government is serious about uh, if, if all event, other options fail, is serious about attacking Iran's nuclear weapons program, then the Russians may be more inclined to go along with pressure, especially a very tight economic <coughs> sanctions that could possibly force greater flexibility from the Iranians. I'm not convinced in the end it will work, but I do expect that when Obama and Putin soon meet, that they will be discussing how to handle Iran because the time for decision is coming. The next U.S. president, which I'll be talking about in my lecture uh, next month, will be um, the next U.S. president is going to be facing that decision about what to do about Iran. Uh, for now, the rest of this year, Iran's not going to have nuclear weapons, but how to prevent it from acquiring nuclear weapons is an issue that will have to be decided soon. So let me end then by saying that Russian foreign policy, I don't think is going to be drastically changed by the outcome of uh, this month's election, the, the presidential election. The return of Putin doesn't mark much of a change, in part because Putin never left. That even when he had uh, agreed to serve as prime minister for four years, with Medvedev kept in to uh, hold the office for him, it really was Putin who had the ultimate say on events in Russia. There were certain nuances that were different under Medvedev. For example, the, Russia's decision to go along with the operation in Libya last year seems to have been something that Medvedev was far more willing to do than Putin was. So there are certain nuances that will change, but the basic policy I don't think will change. That if you look at the way I've characterized these issues, it's basically been the same under both Putin and Medvedev. So Putin's return is not going to mark a drastic change, it's just going to make Russia a continued difficult country to deal with on some issues.